Hi, everyone. Um, I have to say, as I'm listening to these presentations, <clears throat> with every presentation, I think to myself, I second that, I second that, I second that. Um, maybe we should do a manifesto, like CIAM, you know, anyway. Um, so there's so much good material here. And I was a bit flummoxed by the challenge of saying anything meaningful in five minutes. Um, and now you've all intimidated me into feeling even more flummoxed. Uh, <clears throat> so in any case, if we think about a, a post-COVID world, um, I mean, there, COVID is only one thing. We have climate change. We have the horrifying political situation that we're currently in. <clears throat> Excuse me. I force myself uh, in preparation for this morning to think about this as an opportunity. Never waste a good crisis. Uh, so how can we not waste this crisis? Um, one thing I think is pretty clear is that with the pandemic, uh, pressure has been put on space as a meaningful, as a meaningful category of discussion. Uh, we know that living in certain neighborhoods puts you at higher risk uh, for for catching what can be this deadly disease. Um, <clears throat> We, um, we all have this imperative to social distance, but what does that mean, social distancing six feet? You know, uh, six feet is a, is a pretty long way away, as that wonderful video showed you with that guy in the umbrella thing moving down the sidewalk. You know, most sidewalks don't really allow six feet of social distancing. Um, we have to quarantine. We have to quarantine. That means that we're in one space again and again and again, day after day after day. And so suddenly space and the design of space is really is on a lot of people's minds. Uh, it's always on architects' minds, but I think a lot more people are beginning to realize uh, how critical space is and its design uh, <clears throat> in, in light of this situation. And so the opportunity that we have, I think, is to reframe how we talk about what it is that architects and landscape architects and urban designers do. Uh, <clears throat> and we reframe it in the following way. This is picking up on a bunch of things that many of you have said, uh, which is that we, we could jettison the language of value. Um, you know, good design adds value. Uh, Susan, you talked about return on investment. Like, how do we talk about return on investment for what we're calling human-centered design or whatever? Um, so we, we could jettison the, the language of value completely, which is based in economics. And, um, and we move instead, do you have the next slide now, everyone? Yes, okay. Um, we move instead to the language of public health. Um, because what we have learned is that there is a, an intermeshed, integral, inevitable relationship between someone's health and quality of life and the design of the spaces that that person has access to and can use, from education to to public parks, to neighborhoods, and so on and so forth. And what I'm doing here, this is just a little diagram with all these different public health you'll see is in the middle. Um, <clears throat> the, the different factors and dimensions in public health, what I'm effectively doing is proposing a concept that I've gotten from Martha Nussbaum and Amartya Sen, um, who write about international development. They basically say, they argued that when you're talking about the health of a country, it's not enough to simply use metrics around physical health, like uh, mortality, you know, infant mortality, or maternal mortality, or uh, or shortened lifespans from pollution, or all these things that public health issues public health officials talk about all the time. Um, that's not enough, argue Nussbaum and Sen. They basically argue that what you need to do is measure also 
how much a society uh, fosters human cap what they call human capabilities. Uh, <clears throat> that people, yes, people have a fundamental right to live in environments that, uh, that don't harm them, that don't have toxic waste, uh, that, you know, et cetera, et cetera, that don't have COVID running everywhere and killing at least elderly people and lots of other people. But people also have a right to live in a society, in a country, in a polity that fosters, allows them to foster their own capabilities. And um, this is Martha Nussbaum. Um, so you need life, number one, and you know, the preservation of life, you need bodily health, number two, you need bodily integrity, you need stimulation for your senses, for your imaginations, for your thoughts. Uh, you need stimulation and the uh, uh, fostering of the right side kinds of emotions and so on, of um, self-consciousness and self-awareness and so on. So, um, <clears throat> okay, how does this really, how does this relate how, how does this change what we do? Um, it takes it away from, it takes design uh, of any sort away from the language of this would be nice to the language of it's essential. Uh, and some of this progress has already been made. I mean, we now have laws that mandate non-toxic materials, that mandate a certain kind of ventilation, that some countries have laws that talk about uh, that mandate good daylight for office environments and so on and so forth. So, but what I'm saying is uh, over and above those basics, which relate to physical health, uh, there are some less obvious things which that are aesthetic uh, that relate to the nurturing and fostering of human capabilities. Uh, and so here on the screen, um, just as one example, I was trying to think of a quick example of this. Aldo van Eyck, a post-war architect uh, in the Netherlands, uh, were, were at, for the city of Amsterdam after World War II, built around 700 playgrounds uh, in interstitial and leftover spaces uh, all throughout Amsterdam. And many of them are still there. Uh, some of them are not. Very simple, the bottom one you can see, it's just basically a paint job and a concrete circle. Um, I mean, we're not gonna go through. That. But I think that one thing that we've learned from quarantining, from, uh, from the differential impact of COVID-19 in these things is the importance of locality and place and creating a sense of locality in place. We've learned um, certainly politically about the fragility of our political institutions. Um, don't get me going. Um, <clears throat> and, uh, so, and all of this means that it's up to us as designers, architects, landscape architects and so on to really reinforce a sense of locality and place. Um, wherever we're going. And that's an aesthetic issue um, <clears throat> as much as it is anything else. And in order to do that, we need to follow up on some of the things that Susan was talking about, which is deal with what we know about how people appropriate, apprehend, and, and remember and have meaningful, remember places and have meaningful experiences within them. Uh, <clears throat> and for that, you need a certain set of aesthetic tools like multi-sensory design is critical. Um, no more privileging just the visual and the sort of iconic part of it. Uh, sequential opportunities and sequential opportunities over time for surprise, for wonder, for mystery, to have these kinds of meaningful experiences that are, that are specifically connected to a neighborhood and a place uh, <clears throat> that... Sarah? Yeah, am I finished? Yeah, yeah you're, you're a bit over, so I'm going to have to ask you to wind up. Okay, no problem. Uh, metacognition, that's it. <laughs> uh, places, that, places that promote metacognition is the last one. Okay, thanks. <laughs>